This episode brought to you by ExpressVPN, the best VPN there is. Take back your online privacy today. Next Sunday, A.D. Ow! Sorry. Now everything's networked, but they hire bounty hunters like me to track down hackers. Get the girl, get paid. Bring us the girl, wipe Don't away what? the debt. Ow! Good you one. started it. Bloodthirsty bounty hunters, crooked cops, rogue hackers. That puppet from Simpsons does colors now? Ow! I was legitimately asking. <laughs> My nexus point, the narrator sounds like an ex-Power Ranger. Ow! Why did I think you guys would be quiet for my presentation? On that note, yes, that is Johnny's voice for the trailer, and he also does the music for the series. I knew it sounded like he drove a minivan and a frog in his teens. You could tell that with his voice? Tell me how going with this job. And that was my new comic series on Webtoon. I'm gonna assume you hated it. Honestly, it looked pretty cool. Yeah, I'd read it. But you guys made fun of it the whole time. That's what we do for everything. Especially things we love. Yeah, like you're bald. <laughs> You're bald! Yeah, but you're bald. So does this sound like something you guys can promote? Well, Trevor, you clearly worked very hard on this, but we have to find something to review that's in the same vein. Yeah, like maybe a review that we were all in. Or a series of reviews we could needlessly tag onto. Well, The Matrix was one of the inspirations for the series. That's good to know. Now, if you'll excuse me, we're gonna review Matrix Resurrections. But we'll let you know if we think of a tie-in. Yeah, and let us know if that Johnny Young guy gets up to anything big. He's in some of the biggest animes of all time. Anime? That's still a thing? I give it two more years. Anyway, keep in touch. Mr. Alger Critic. Yes. Are you okay? I mean, less than usual? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Um, keep in touch. Would you care to regenerate your energy levels with the consumption of grounded minerals in the hopes of continuing our search for purpose? What? You want some coffee? Oh, no, I'm good. I should probably do something about this. But usually it works itself out in 20 to 30 minutes. <laughs> in December of 2021. Did it. Almost 20 years have passed since you pretended you saw the last Matrix movie, and now the Wachowskis, minus one, are back to give you the... final part? Yeah, definitely the final part. As the film seems to spell out, Warner Brothers want an go at their most popular movie series... most popular movie. Again, a lot of folks didn't get into the sequels, but they seem to make enough to get Warner Brothers to say to Lana Wachowski. Lana. Lana. Lana! Until she agreed to come back and brought some of the leads with her. The movie bombed pretty fierce though and got mixed reactions from critics and fans. As someone who didn't get into the original film that much but did value the impact it had, I have to admit, I did enjoy a good chunk of this film. I liked a lot of the self-reflection, psychological dives, and more character insight into a series that frankly had no character insight. Put bluntly, I was really enjoying this Matrix movie until it became a Matrix movie. Did that make it worth the reboot all these years later, though? Well, let's dive in head first to find out. This is... Hey, Critic, I was wondering if... If the consequences of our personal actions reflect the consequences of our species as a whole? No. If I could have the last Slim Jim. Oh. Yeah, fine. Wait, Tamara! Under those clothes, are you wearing leather? If I finish that question, you're gonna sue us, aren't you? My lawyer's on speed dial. Go eat your Slim Jim. This is... not suspicious at all. So your first thought might be, this is another one of those sequels that does the exact same thing all over again. Yeah, it's not as bad as you think it is, but for different reasons. This is a simulation of the first movie that's a test, I think, for agents. 
A spy named Bugs, played by Jessica Henwick, watches as some things seem different in the simulation. Oh, look, we know what happens next. She kicks that ass. That's why I said it. As you know, trust me, the writing does get better. Oh, that kick was a little off. No doubt that'll be the worst part of the action sequences in this film. They call me Cobra Bubbles. Can't help but wonder if there's some subtext with Lana reluctantly returning to this series. The same way Neo is an anagram for one, Lana could be an anagram for Alan. It turns out one of the agents, played by Yaya Abdul-Mateen, somehow is a program embodying Morpheus. And I'll be totally honest, I got that from the wiki page because their explanation of this is like the architect speech light. Do you know this is a modal? It's a modal. Simulation used to evolve programs. I know what I am. Digital sentience. Just a flicker, but suddenly I understood. We, like the we can't see it. We're all trapped inside these strange repeats. Okay, can we get the Bruce Willis fifth element sum up? That <laughs> Sure. I am Morpheus. Thank you. But wait! That's Morpheus. Yeah, if you're wondering why they didn't have Lawrence Fishburne reprise his role, get this. In one of the Matrix games that nobody played, Morpheus is killed. And of course the Wachowskis would be die hard about this being canon, so Fishburne wasn't even asked to return. Because Lord knows bringing a person back to life, two people back to life, just wouldn't be believable in this world. Missed that overwritten dialogue yet? You call this a choice? Oh, honestly, when somebody offered me these things, I went off on binary conceptions of the world and said that there was no way I was following some symbolic reduction in my life. Jesus, somebody give that woman an Oscar just for trying to say that in one breath! Just saying yes in a Wachowski film means reading half a thesaurus at machine gun speed. He takes the pill and we cut to Neo, played again by Keanu Reeves, who's been given the most impressive reboot of the film. He's been programmed to actually act in this. Having a mental breakdown again, while I'm living inside a computer-generated reality that has imprisoned me again. <laughs> Okay, so I've made a lot of jokes about Reeves' underacting in his earlier films, including The Matrix, but honestly, I think he's gotten a lot better over the years. He's proven to have a really decent range, and even in a role like this, where he's supposed to not really care, he does so in an engaging way. My mind made it all up. Is that what you believe? It felt real. In this world, he's a game designer who made The Matrix as a hit trilogy. He has a crush on a lady in a coffee shop, played by Carrie Ann Moss, he tried jumping off a building because he had a nervous breakdown and couldn't tell fantasy from reality, so now he sees a therapist. Despite his success, he can't connect well with people and feels numb being at the top, getting out all his passions in his games because he's too nervous to do so in real life. This is my very good friend Thomas Anderson. I'm sorry about this. Jesus, we just talked to her. Yeah, this isn't just acting. This is a legitimately interesting character. What I know about this guy? Um... He thought there was another world, but all of them thought that. Uh, he hated his job, I think. Uh, he's the one, whoa! I'd rather watch a dozen movies starring this guy than one with the one. Hi, Thomas. Everyone calls me Chip. I hate my husband and I'm desperate for an affair. Speaking of which. This is my husband, Chad. Nice to meet you. Hey. Don't cross me, bro. I am literally a Chad. Look at this, they meet up a few times in the movie. And you know what they do? They chat. Not over-explain or discuss the meaning of life or something. They just chat, like what people do. So what's it like being a world-famous game designer must be amazing. Sometimes it is amazing. Most times, I don't know. They chat about their insecurities, their passions, the lives they have versus the lives they originally wanted. In a series where the computers talk more like humans and the humans talk more like computers, I love seeing these two actually be allowed to act. Another coincidence, I love motorcycles. My friend Kush and I actually build them. I didn't know she liked motorcycles. I thought she just rode them because it's part of the mission. It's ten times more than I ever knew about her in three whole movies! I'm too goddamn tired. <laughs> kids are exhausting, you know? No. Never had kids. Oh, right. I knew that. I like seeing these two talk. They're a cute couple when they're not just discussing protocol or sucking face. Even the super meta setup, which granted has been done to death in other remakes, does make sense here. This cannot be another reboot, retread, regurgitate. Why not? Reboot sell. Yes, every reboot nowadays has to act all self-aware like they're the first one to do it. But seeing how The Matrix was about questioning reality already, I think it kind of fits. You can tell this is where Lana opens up about not knowing how to accept her creation for what it is and how other people interpret it. 
Obviously, the Matrix is about trans politics. Crypto fascism. It's a metaphor of capitalist exploitation. Honestly, I make jokes about the fans taking the films too seriously, but this movie does it for me. The paradox between free will and destiny. We kept some kids entertained. Hey, I tell you, it took over my life. We need guns. Lots of guns. Also, being at the top, I'm sure, can feel too good to be true and even like a fantasy, which this clearly feeds into. I kind of like the idea that Neo is trying to push away from the messiah complex he might have made for himself. And best of all, the past three movies can technically be seen as a nervous breakdown. It could just be a geek getting too deep into his own self-indulgent fantasy, which yes, I'm sure a lot of fans wouldn't like because that would take away from their own fantasy. You converted elements of your life into narrative. A married woman named Tiffany became the trinity of a doomed romance. I know people have their own take on things and that's fine, but for me, I love Muad'Dib does not bring world peace. Luke Skywalker doesn't become a perfect being. Even Cinderella doesn't fully achieve her happily ever after. Do these need to exist? No, but if they're going to, bring on the next logical conflict reality would give them. On that note, his developing partner, played by Jonathan Groff, says Warner Brothers wants another Matrix. Man, I thought the other films hit the nail on the head. Warner Brothers has decided to make a sequel to the trilogy, and they made it clear they'll kill our contract if we don't cooperate. Don't worry, after the merge with Discovery, all drama will disappear. As blatant as this is, and I guess spells out why Wachowski number two didn't come back for this one, I will give Warner Brothers credit, they left that in the movie. <laughs> Though I'd love to see how they dealt with this if it turns out that was just an oversight. They informed me they're gonna do it with or without us. I thought they couldn't do that. Oh, they can. Now, if you'll excuse me, a cartoon duck is calling me into the lobby. Fire! Neo's therapist, played by Neil Patrick Harris, suggests he up his pill dosage, keeping him more in reality. And more importantly, I remember how hard it was for you to share something like this. Which tells me just how far we've come. Well, he does great, I will be honest. All I'm thinking is how much him and Jonathan Groff must have been tap dancing show tunes whenever the cameras weren't rolling. Now that's a duo I want to see Neo fight! Neo gets a message, though, just as the building is given an emergency evacuation. Cellophane. Mr. Cellophane. Kinda of Morpheus approaches him in a kinda of Morpheus way. Seriously, his tone goes back and forth so much, I have no idea what he's supposed to be like. This is the moment for you to show us what is real. Welcome to the crib. Learning all about you. And me. At last. Wasn't too sure about the callback, but you know, it's just hard to resist. This isn't a war, it's a murder. This isn't a war, it's a moita. After all that imagery showing how taking pills numbs you to reality, here, take this pill to see reality. We discover his partner was actually a reprogrammed version of Agent Smith. Yes, that character died too, but this was scheduling conflicts. We get an action sequence and... So far, it's okay. It looks Matrixy enough, it's smooth and cool looking, but he suddenly appears in his therapist's office and thinks it's all just another mental breakdown. I actually got so swept up in how well they cover their bases for either reality being real that I totally forgot they pretty much showed the Matrix was real with the other characters earlier. But again, maybe it's because I actually care about these characters that I forgot about those other scenes so quickly. It's what artists do, but it becomes a problem when fantasies endanger us. Bugs intercepts him though and takes him to a theater where film strips from the game are playing. Nothing comforts anxiety like little nostalgia. Look at me, I've been calm for freaking years. After he takes the pill, he's confronted by his therapist who tells him he broke into his home. Please, this is not a game. Feel my hand. This is what is real. God, deep down, I knew the movie wasn't smart enough to leave it ambiguous so you have to decide what's real, but I'll be honest, I was kind of questioning what was happening in this moment. Again, both realities seem plausible. They try to escape into a train, but agents locate them and, oh no, we really are back in 1999. They're doing that shitty few frames trick that everybody would wish would die. Nothing comforts anxiety like a little nostalgia. Yeah, but not bad nostalgia! I do like the idea of how a literal point of view can help them escape. That mirror. We never fit. Think perspective. The closer you are, the bigger it gets. So you mean, <gasps> I'm squashing your heads! Oh my god, I wish that was a scene. <laughs> Neo escapes, wakes up from the Matrix, and is taken to Bugs' ship. So there you go, that's 53 minutes of good. Now get ready for 104 minutes of bad.
Hey, Critic, I've been checking out that Nexus Point comic. It's actually pretty good. Yeah, I'm sorry, have things slowly been getting more green around here? Oh, I think we're trying to be more environmentally friendly. No, I mean literally green. Oh, good, because I was completely making that up. Wait a minute, why are you wearing black leather? Why aren't you wearing black leather? Oh, that's a good point. I should go change- Hey, wait, that's not how this works! Hey, Critic, I thought of another way that we can work the comic in. What if we take the main character, Sally- Can you call her Jenny? What? why I like the name Jenny. But I spent weeks trying to come up with the perfect name for her. I like the name Jenny. Okay, fine. I'll use Sally somewhere else. So Sally, I mean Jemmy, starts working at a tech company and gets chased by the bad guys just like Neo in the Matrix. Does she say whoa? Does she have to say whoa? I think she needs to say whoa. All right, she says whoa. Will everything be green and gray like in this room for some reason? Silence. What? No, that's the best part. It's like the Matrix, but with a lot more color. Oh, I guess that sounds pretty cool. Okay, I'll think it over. Yes. What? Yes. What? Sounds good, critic. Wait, Trevor was saying that. I'm not Trevor, I'm Malcolm. Did A24 buy us out or something? Hey, Doug Walker here, just kidding, I'm an alligator. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm not an alligator, but I could have been. There are so many dangers out there for your children. Alligators, strangers, alligators. I'm shocked in 2022, every parent has an installed ExpressVPN on their children's devices. You wouldn't let your kid walk home from school and an alligator drives up to him and says, get in my windowless van. No, you wouldn't. Or you know, if a person did that too, I guess that'd be bad. Person who's really an alligator. So why would you let them go online without ExpressVPN? See, every device, phones, computers, tablets, has a unique IP address, which is like an internet phone number and reveals personal information about you, like where you live. Alligators can find that, crocodiles can too, but they're cool. It's super simple for a stranger or an alligator online to find your IP address. If you've ever clicked on a sketchy link or opened an email with a bugged image, your IP address could be exposed. Who knows what kind of creeps could physically track your kids down using their IP addresses? I don't know, could be alligators, ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN is an app that hides your real IP address and replaces it with a dummy one, keeping you safe and private. It's so easy to use, just download the ExpressVPN app on your phone or computer, tap one button to turn it on, and you're protected. Even my child, who I lost to an alligator, could figure it out. I learned my lessons too late. But you don't have to, because here's the coolest part about ExpressVPN. They let you choose what country you want your IP address to look like it's coming from. This is super useful because services like Netflix and Disney Plus give you different shows depending on what country you're in. I and my other child, who got horribly injured by a circus porcupine, don't even get me started about them, loves this. Because because we can just switch our country and get hundreds of extra shows for free. Like just this weekend, we use ExpressVPN to change our country and watch black books on Netflix. My other child loves that show as he's watching on painkillers. So secure your family's online activity and unlock tons of new shows by visiting expressvpn.com slash nostalgiacritic. Use my link and you can get three extra months free. That's expressvpn.com slash nostalgiacritic. Go to expressvpn.com slash nostalgiacritic to learn more. I'm Doug Walker, not an alligator, and I probably revealed too much about my personal life. My therapist says working this into a sponsorship is not healthy, but the product is still good. Fighting back tears is fun. Doug returns to playing Kingdom Hearts in Birth by Sleep every Friday on Twitch. We also have new content six days a week. Hope to see you there. being examined by the ship doctor. What's up, Doc? A character named Bugs just asked a doctor what's up. I hate how much I love that. And we're teleported to the kung fu training scene because you remember the kung fu training scene. I know exactly what you need. Me in an open robe handing you a martini. Man, Lana has been reading the fan theories. Come on, Neo, fight for her! It's the nerdgasm producers think fans are having right now. He wakes up back in his room where Bugs wants to talk with him. Mind if I... Trying to open my beer bottle off you. They took my life, turned it into a video game. And turned it into something trivial. Not so trivial you can't bring actors back because it's canon. Yeah, I'm still stand by the John Wick films are on official simulations. Everything we did... None of it mattered. All of it mattered. It gave us the courage to repeat the same shit over again. 
Yeah, we're basically back to business as usual with everyone sucking Neo's dick, praising him as the one. Not a fanboy out here, but this is kind of a huge moment for me. Berg is our resident Neoologist. Oh, Jesus. Literally, I like it better when he thought he had a Jesus complex. Remember, therapist bad, being the chosen one good, and pills... Still figuring that one out, I guess. They are Scythians. It's a they prefer to machines. One addition I like is they apparently team up with machines in the hopes of making the world better. I would have liked if maybe Neo had a prejudice towards them, but they never do take advantage of that. They do take advantage of Guy Pierce's makeup from Prometheus, though. Niobe? The world was different then. Yep, that's Jaden Pickett Smith reprising her role as Niobe, and while it does look like a latex pancake melted on her face, she actually does an okay job acting under it. A few more wrinkles and a few less teeth, but wise enough to know I don't know anything. Except what pushes your husband's buttons. I think you know that pretty well now. We found the one. I don't believe in the one. I never did. But it's an anagram for Neo! It's clever! It must be true! Hey, gardening! Now shit's getting exciting. Welcome to the garden, Neo. A strawberry? You remember that shit we used to eat. How many adults refer to the trilogy now? So it's a little confusing, but I think after Neo died, the machines started fighting each other. Another idea I think is clever and surprisingly believable. But Neo thinks they're keeping Trandy alive and he wants to save her. Niobe says no, but Waskowy Bug says yes and sneaks him back into the Matrix to get some answers. So what do you think of him? I was kind of worried at first because he's so much older. The beard, the hair, ugh. Ah, when producers thought that would be the biggest problem fans had with the film. They run into Smith and the one cast member I know you were waiting to see again. All these years, I can't believe it. Ah, oh, Pepe Le Pew did not take getting canceled well. It's funny because I don't remember disliking this character. I remember him being kind of fun. But he really is the Jar Jar of this scene. Like he's supposed to distract us from how bad everything else is we're watching and he's about as effective. We had conversation, not this beep, 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 beep. Ugh. Art, face, super suck, and couch flex, I'm with the wiki business shit. I will sequel franchise spin off. Well, at least I can pinpoint the exact moment the meta shit stopped working for me. Like I, and I'm sure others must have pointed out, the other Wachowski must have directed the action because, man, the rest of the fight scenes in this are sloppy as hell. Maybe it's the same effects and choreography, but it's shot via shaking baby cam, so I can't make out if it is or not. They beat Smith back and make it to Trinity, who I'd be really shocked if this wasn't on her bookshelf. But the therapist arrives and reveals he was the mastermind that brought them back to life, freezing them in Cyberpunk 2077 time. I know. Kinda ironic. Using the power that defined you to control you. <laughs> You're not even a real doctor, are you, Mr. Hauser? I was there when you died. I was tentacle number three. Come on, tell me I wasn't programmed from that. First, I had to convince the suits to let me rebuild the two of you. Why her? Getting there. Harris does everything he can to save this rambly dialogue, but at six minutes of yapping and watching him glick like a Jaguar game, it gets pretty headache-inducing. Basically, he said his attempt to bring Neo back to life failed until he decided to bring Trinity back as well. So like they keep saying with Smith and Neo, everything is around the yin and the yang and the yang's girlfriend. I don't know. Here's the thing about feelings. They're so much easier to control than facts. <laughs> You've never interneted, have you? Before you can talk to her more, they're captured and court-martialed. Don't worry, though. We're only here for a mere ten freaking minutes. Yeah, we stay here as they try to convince Niobe to listen to them, figure out a plan, introduce another character you'll forget about by the end, and go over the details of the plan in the real world and the details of the plan in the Matrix world. It's a small hexagonal vent. This vent feeds the air intake into the corpuscular modifier, which oxygenates the biogel used in Neo's pod. I usually love these scenes in heist films where they go over all the cool details, but at this point, I'll accept... Take on, grab Liz, go to the Winchester, nice cold pint, and wait for all this to blow over. They agree to meet the therapist at the coffee shop where nobody questions the SWAT team there. Guess it's just SWAT night. And they give Trinity the choice to be with Neo or her family. No pressure. If she says no, what happens to Neo? At this time, the most important choice in Neo's life is not his to make. Out of our hands. Four words. Out of our hands. This movie would be an hour long if people talked how people talked. She of course chooses Neo, but before the therapist can get them, Smith enters the picture saying he wants revenge on Doogie as well. 
I was free to be me. I do buy that he would want to rough him up also, and yeah, I'll give credit, this is the one scene where the tight, crowded action works. The idea of a whole SWAT team in a coffee shop where it's almost impossible to move is kind of a creative, chaotic, and even a little funny of a place to fight. Stop them. Drat! I've been foiled by the power of love! You think this is over? Box office says... Yes! Smith takes him out, though, and their alliance ends. You know the difference between us, Tom? Anyone could have been you. Or as I've always been anyone. Da, 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 da. They go from SWAT to swarm, though, as everyone in the city literally launches themselves as projectiles towards them. Again, not shot great, but it is a pretty entertaining idea. <laughs> they get to the roof and find the only way out is for them to fly. Well, they're half right. I'm not doing this. Are you doing this? She is... The two! I guess some fans freaked out about this, but I don't know, if each half of them is part of the puzzle, maybe one of them can stop bullets and the other can fly. How romantic. I don't know, if these movies make up shiz, they go, I don't see why this is any different. I just stopped caring when this actually became a Matrix movie again. How dramatic. When Neil Patrick Harris says that, you're dramatic. I like MPH, but I'm not gonna lie, seeing him die multiple times is weirdly kind of enjoyable. MPH is like an NPC, you don't really want to hurt him, but you totally will if they just keep coming back. We were on our way to remake your world. Change a few things. They figure out they have the power to change this reality and decide they're gonna do exactly that. Yeah, you took enough from Dark City, why not officially take the ending too? Why does that sound? Yeah, I'll figure it out in the sum up. You gave us something we never thought we could have. Another chance. Yes, thank you, Warner Brothers, for forcing Lana's hand, but it's, I guess, a good thing? What am I supposed to be left with here, movie? I don't know, I guess not enough people thought it was a good thing because, like I said, it didn't do very well. Hey, Critic, I think I got it figured out. Can you join me for a sec? Good to see you again. Yes. Wait a minute. <laughs> we thought the Matrix had left us, but we were wrong. Don't you mean Dark City? Doesn't matter. Half the people won't look it up. And now the Matrix must consume you as well. Attack! No! Did she just throw herself at me? No! How did this cost more than the last time we did this? Toss yourselves! Toss yourselves like your bullet bills! Yeah! I don't know, is this all coming from the webcomic you were pitching? Perhaps. I'm not sure. It all started when I mentioned The Matrix as an inspiration. No! How many of you were getting so caught up in how The Matrix inspired us, we're not letting it do exactly that. Inspire us. <laughs> For me, the best stuff was in the first third. It was reflective, experimental, combined old elements with new elements to say something that was kind of insightful from the creator. When the film tries to recapture what made people love the original, that's where it goes downhill for me. Had this been more like an epilogue rather than a sequel, similar to what something like Steven Universe Future was, I think this would have gotten a lot more respect from both fans and critics. Because The Matrix is becoming different things to different people. You even said it inspired your comic, but you made it more colorful and added your own unique touch. When Lana did that, added her own unique touch as a different person years later, chunks of it were pretty cool. Hell, she even added a lot more color in this movie than any of the previous movies ever had. Are you saying that my comic may have inspired a Hollywood movie? You know that makes no sense. I know. But maybe others did. People took inspiration from The Matrix, gave their own spin on it, and then Lana was possibly inspired by that and put a new unique spin on it. So in a way, it does kind of come full circle. Does it work? I guess not. I think the studio figured people wanted to see more flying around and over-explaining rather than a subdued and complex direction. But the first third is some of my favorite stuff in any of The Matrix movies. So even though I can't say it all comes together, a good chunk of it I still found really fascinating. And I'm glad I got to see something more reflective and low-key. Uh, for a certain amount of time. So does this mean that we're not going to do a big flashy climax? Oh, I don't think their heads can handle it, man. Perhaps it is time to let the Matrix become something else. Oh, hey, Critic, when'd you 
could become triplets. I'll buy you both later. Oh, thank God. First, there's the small matter of Trevor's webcomic. So you're gonna put Nexus Point in a review? Hell no. But you said you liked it. You tried to kill us, man. What kind of example would I be setting for Malcolm and Tamara? Oh, you can call me Rachel Deeds. What the hell, dude? I had everything set to go. Sorry, it ain't happening. So I can't say there are new episodes on Webtoons every Saturday and they should just click the link in the description. No. And remind me to go back and edit that part out because I might be too lazy and forget. Hey, for you, buddy. Now, if you excuse me, where I'm going, we don't need roads. That's not even the right... <laughs> Oh my god, that was stupid! Oh, that hurt! Oh, Christ! There's a ceiling up there! Yeah. The floor hurts! Bullet bill. Floor and ceiling it's hurts! hurts. This What's wrong with us? This place scares me. We're you all scare me. Adult. We're not adults! We are not adults! Oh, honestly, when somebody offered me these things, I went off of binary conceptions of the world and said that there was no way I was following some symbolic reduction in my life. We're continuing cameos for charity, and all this month, we're donating to Living Beyond Breast Cancer. Living Beyond Breast Cancer is fulfilling its mission to provide trusted information and a community of support to those impacted by the disease. They offer in-person experiences and on-demand emotional, practical, and evidence-based content that is meaningful to those newly diagnosed, in treatment, post-treatment, and living with metastatic disease. Having done this for over 30 years and having a four-star rating on Charity Navigator, this is definitely a great one to support. So if you want a cameo from me saying happy birthday or congrats or whatever, click on the link below and be giving to a good cause. Or if you're like, I hate your face, I don't want a cameo from you, still consider looking at this charity anyway. Whether you donate, volunteer, or just spread the word, you can do a lot in helping this wonderful organization out. So click on the link and give it a look. Thanks so much.